1992, Hong Kong released a film called Dr. Lam, featuring leading star Simon Yam, who portrayed the life and crimes of a man the news media would dub the Jar's murderer because of the jars of evidence police found in his bedroom. He also liked to call himself the Rainy Night Killer because apparently rain would get him excited and give him the impulse to attack. Hi everyone, today we're going to explore what's considered to be the first known serial homicide case in the history of Hong Kong. Now, for people who were there at the time and they're old enough to remember it, it's a grisly tale that still haunts them to this day. So let's take a look at some of the lives that were impacted by the depravities of a local taxi driver by the name of Lam Kor Wan. Lam was born in 1955 and his parents separated early on in his life. So when he was still very young, he would move to Brunei, a small country located on an island between Malaysia and Indonesia. There he grew up with his biological father, Lam Wai Lok, and his stepmother. His father, who had actually married three times, was a rather tough dad who had no problem admitting that Lam received beatings from him as a kid. This was partly why Lam's childhood was particularly rough. He missed his biological mother dearly and often felt isolated and lonely. He never quite developed a social circle, never made any close friends, and never had a girlfriend. He was quite reclusive and spent most of his time alone. As a young adult, he said he did try to lose his virginity by going to a sex worker, but he was impotent and couldn't perform. He said this woman mocked him and made him feel embarrassed, so he was too intimidated to try again. Unfortunately, this meant he turned towards finding a partner, so to speak, who wouldn't talk or move or give him a hard time. In other words, he started becoming obsessed with dead female bodies, a situation where he could photograph a woman and pretty much do whatever he wanted to her. This was his full-blown mindset by the time he and his family moved to Hong Kong, and he was 27 years old, working as a taxi driver, servicing the Jim Sa Jai area of Kowloon Harbor. So if you're looking at Hong Kong and you zoom in, the mass of land north of the water here would be Kowloon region. And at the south tip of his harbor is the Jim Sa Jai area. Kowloon Harbor has many sites and destinations for entertainment. You have art museums, space museums, cultural centers. Of course, you have hotels and resorts. Over here, you have the Kowloon Park. If we squeeze our way into this road right here, this is Nathan Road, which is basically the Broadway of Kowloon. Lots of nightclubs, restaurants, cafes, bars, they got everything here. So this was more or less the stomping grounds for Lam Kar Wan, where he would roam around to find passengers and eventually his victims. On the night of February 5th, 1982, on Kimberley Road in Tsim Sa a 21-year-old woman was leaving work to go home. She was just hanging out with her sister as they had met up after her shift. Her sister asked to leave and go home together, but for whatever reason, this woman insisted on taking a taxi back by herself. Now, she was rather intoxicated, and every taxi she was trying to catch refused to give her a ride because she appeared to be too drunk until one finally let her in. Her sister saw her take off in that vehicle, which belonged to taxi driver Lam Korwan. During the ride, she kept changing her mind about the destination and which direction she wanted Lam to go. And at one point, Lam said she started vomiting either inside the car or out on the side of the car. Lam insists that on that night, he never started with any intentions of killing anyone. He would state that this woman's antics annoyed and infuriated him until the point he just snapped and started strangling her in the heat of the moment. He then took a large rice bag that he happened to have in his vehicle and stuffed her body in there. The fact that this happened late at night because he worked the night shift gave him a few advantages. Hardly anyone out at that time or around his neighborhood and he was able to sneak the body inside his building without anyone even seeing it. And of course his whole family would be asleep at that hour. He initially hid the body under the living room couch. Until the next morning, he would wait for all of his family members to leave for the day for work or school, at which point he'd have the whole place to himself. With everyone gone, he took the body into his bedroom, where he would immediately set up his photo shoot, so to speak. After carrying out his sick ritual for a few hours, he dismembered the body, cleaned up his bedroom, and dumped the remains here at Shingmun River, located in the region of New Territories, which is north of Kowloon. More than a week would go by before civilians reported seeing a strange bag floating on this river. When police arrived, they would find a human head inside. <laughs> Once a full search team got involved, they found a larger bag which contained a pair of human adult legs. Eventually, they also located the torso and a pair of severed arms, one of which had a tattoo on it. This tattoo would help authorities identify the victim as Chan Feng Lan. She had been leaving from a shift as a nightclub hostess, where she worked to support her family, which included two children, 
and her husband, who had reported her missing. The first step Hong Kong police took was checking if Chan had any problems at home, if perhaps her husband was behind this. With her husband cleared as a suspect, the next step was revisiting the last time someone saw her and connecting it to the taxi cab that picked her up. But her sister never saw the face of the driver, didn't catch the license plate, and couldn't provide any distinctive details about the vehicle that she hopped into. So at that point, police had no further leads or clues to follow up on regarding the abduction of Chan Feng Lan. For the next five months, Lam would claim three more lives, including Chan Wan Kit, a 31-year-old cashier who worked the night shift, and 29-year-old Leung Sao Wan, a nightclub waitress. Contrary to the first murder, these women were targeted as part of a premeditated attack. As a full-fledged serial killer, Lam now prepped and planned for his next victim. The pattern of each of the killings was basically that he would pick up the passenger, drive her to a location where he would strangle her inside the vehicle, and then take the body back to his home and inside his bedroom. And once he was there, he would either dismember the body and or remove her reproductive organs. And he also confessed to having sex with the body of at least one of his victims. All the while, he's photographing and videotaping the entire process every step of the way. One thing that changed after the first killing was that he disposed of the remains in a new location, which turned out to be the bushy trenches in Tai Hang Road on Hong Kong Island, the opposite harbor south of Kowloon. Police would come here later to eventually retrieve the remains of Chan Wan Kit, Lung Sao Wan, and the final victim, 17-year-old Lung Wai Sum. Lung Wai Sum normally took the metro bus and subways to get around town. But on the night she was abducted, her mother had given her money to take a taxi home, perhaps because it was a special occasion. See, on that night in July of 1982, Lung had just finished a graduation dinner at the Sheraton Hotel on Nathan Road. She came out to catch a taxi and got into Lam's car. During Lam's recounting of that ride, he noted Lung's slightly younger age compared to his previous victims. For some reason, he felt compelled to strike up a seemingly normal conversation with her about school and career, at least in the beginning. Before long, she started to get creeped out by her driver and tried to exit the vehicle. According to Lam, he would handcuff her inside the car and ended up driving her around town for six hours. She eventually fell asleep, still handcuffed, and he said this is when he strangled her. Over a month later, on August 17, 1982, staff at a Kodak photo shop in Mong Kok were looking at some prints from a customer who came in regularly. This customer often printed unusual images of women's body parts. The photos seemed to be getting more and more bizarre and disturbing, so the staff reported it to the police. Since they didn't have a name or address for the customer, and they had to wait for this individual to show up in person, the cops set up an undercover sting operation at the shop where he was expected to come back to pick up his prints. Lam Kor Wan arrived and was arrested on the spot. Lam was driven to the police station while a search team went to his home, a small apartment he shared with his parents and younger stepbrother in Kowloon. They lived on the first floor of an old building. As Lam's postmortem atrocities were committed more or less entirely inside his bedroom, it's rather impressive he actually shared this bedroom with his brother. They slept on bunk beds, and Lam hid the most incriminating items under his bed, in a large box, and inside a closet. Other than that, he had all his photo and video recording equipment in plain sight inside that bedroom. His brother never knew of the horrors that took place in there. After hours of searching, investigators retrieved photo studio equipment, video recording equipment, stacks of videotapes, surgical instruments, books on human anatomy, stacks of pornographic material, thousands of photos of severed female body parts, Tupperware jars of human remains, including women's reproductive organs. They were soaking in some kind of liquid that was most likely formaldehyde. 
Based on the magnitude of evidence found, compared to the tiny perimeter of the home, police were sure his brother and father were accomplices in these gruesome killings. However, after initially refusing to talk, Lamb would confess that he was solely responsible for all the murders and mutilations of the remains found, so his brother and father were freed. He also directed police to Taihang Road to retrieve the bodies of the last three victims. Forensics anthropology specialists were able to match the remains with missing persons' IDs and verify who the three women were. On March 3, 1983, the trial began, and in terms of criminal trials, this was one of the biggest media frenzies Hong Kong had ever seen. Lam was facing four charges of murder. The crowds began gathering in the afternoon when news got around about what must be Hong Kong's most sensational trial. Seven men were picked for the jury because it was considered that the more than 1,000 pieces of evidence to be presented in the case were too gruesome for women. Lamb, along with his defense team, led by Gilbert Rodway, sought to have the charges reduced to manslaughter, claiming temporary insanity and that he committed these horrors as a result of delusions and hearing voices and orders from God. His own mother came forward and supported this notion of his mental illness, suggesting that it was due to the abusive upbringing he suffered at the hands of his father. Australian psychiatrist David Barnes testified that he's convinced that Lam is suffering from serious psychosis, a mental disease that can lay dormant for many years until it's jerked into activity by a possibly trivial incident. Numerous psychiatrists examined him and offered their analysis on his condition and mindset. Some believed he had a disorder preventing him from controlling his actions, whereas others looked at his series of crimes and how meticulously it must have been laid out and determined he was too smart and calculated to fit the criteria of insanity. So on April 8, 1983, the trial concluded with a guilty verdict for all four counts of murder. The seven-man jury began their deliberation at about 11.30 a.m. and shortly after 3 p.m., they returned with a unanimous verdict of murder on all four counts. In a hardly audible voice, Judge Baber then sentenced Lam Gua Wan to death. The father of Lam's first victim, Chan Fung Lan, said the verdict was very fair and he will tell his daughter about it at her grave. Hong Kong was generally happy with the outcome. I think most people felt execution would be the just punishment. However, given that Hong Kong was still under British rule and following British protocols, where the UK had already abolished the death penalty for murder, the sentence was soon commuted to a life term in prison. And so Lam Kor Wan was sent to Shekpik Prison on Lantau Island in Hong Kong, where he remains in prison to this day. These are the latest images of him from 2010. Hong Kong has always been ranked as one of the safest cities in the world. That's part of the reason why the Jars murders are still so unique and still considered one of the most shocking homicide cases in the city's history. In the annals of local crime and violence, over 40 years later, there still hasn't been a case quite as grotesque and deviant. After the trial, his father, Lam Wai Lok, dedicated a space at the Yuan Yan Institute Temple to honor and memorialize the victims. Four women who may have had different jobs, different lifestyles, but they all had one thing in common. They were each catching a taxi ride home or to wherever they needed to get to next. They were in a space where they felt safe and had every right to feel that way. Chan Feng Lan left behind a sister, a husband, and two children. And just like Chan Wan Kit and Leung Sao Wan, they had all just finished a hard night's work. It was a dedication of people like them that built the thriving entertainment and tourist hub that Jim Sa Jae came to be known for. And finally, Leung Wai Sum had just celebrated her high school graduation with friends and classmates. She had her whole life ahead of her. The lives of four beautiful souls cut short, but they have not been forgotten. Thank you all for tuning into this episode today.